Colleen Sawyer, and <clears throat> I have lived in Broomfield for over 35 years. Um, my parents are from Michigan, and my mother did live here for seven years um, before she passed away in 2012. So we do have a Broomfield connection to this presentation. Um, and I don't know if some of you had a chance to see the posters that we had that we had on the screen, but um, if you didn't, I will pass these around. These are some um, posters and advertising to use V-mail during World War II. So I'll just pass these around. You can just look through them and pass them on. Okay. And I apologize for some of you in the audience that have heard this presentation many, many times. Um, so I tried to, I'll try to make it fresh and <laughs> new. But I have my little fans here that, you know, come around and they've, they've heard it many times. But groupies. My groupies, yeah, my groupies. So um, this is a paper, a research paper that I wrote for a, for a class that I took, a history class that I took at Front Range Community College. And then um, I decided and was encouraged to, um, to work on it and take it on the road. So, um, so this is the research that I did on the letters of World War II. Hi, Roberta. We were just talking about you. We were just talking about you before you got here. Okay. 1941, Saginaw, Michigan. Jane Reamer, age 21, was a carefree, sociable, single working woman. December 7, 1941, changed Jane's world. The attack on Pearl Harbor galvanized the United States to enter World War II. The young men Jane knew joined the military and were shipped overseas. Jane and her friends joined the war, war effort at home. 1941, Detroit, Michigan. George Bud Sawyer was a handsome, friendly, 25-year-old athlete. He had a bright future ahead in professional baseball. The attack of Pearl Harbor on December 7, 1941, drastically changed the course of his life. He enlisted in the 5th Army and was shipped to Casablanca, North Africa, and later he served in Anzio, Italy. George and Jane had met once on a double date before the war, when George was dating Jane's best friend, Cease. Three years later, in 1943, Cease encouraged Jane to write to George so that he would get some mail from home. They began a correspondence of three years with over 100 letters. Their letters rekindled their acquaintance and deepened their relationship from friendship to love. World War II affected the American people in profound ways, and the letters sent back and forth across the ocean had the most lasting impact of all. Author Tom Brokaw stated that the legacy of letters reveals a new, intensely personal perspective of a momentous time in our history. Letters were the primary connection between people of all levels of society in the 1940s. Even Franklin Roosevelt and Winston Churchill, the two leaders of the free world, got acquainted and came to admire each other as allies and friends because of their voluminous correspondence during the war. Ordinary Americans, both those who fought and those who stayed on the home front, wrote prolifically about their moving and unforgettable lives. The importance of war correspondence cannot be understated. It was second only to food. The letters boosted morale on the front and at home, communicated every kind of news, and most importantly, changed many relationships. The love story of George Sawyer and Jane Reamer is unique, yet typical of many wartime romances that blossomed during the war through letters. 
War correspondence strongly affected Americans' relationships. Servicemen wrote to their families, friends, and even strangers. <clears throat> some of these strangers became friends, and in some cases, romances. Some people barely knew each other, but began corresponding, and some who met by chance during the drama of World War II stayed together for the rest of their lives. The war brought together unlikely couples, and letter writing became the chief means of getting acquainted. Couples fell in love, debated, and even argued as the mail continued to flow back and forth. George and Jane could not have been more different in religion, politics, taste in music, and temperament. Yet their letters gave them an opportunity to share and communicate deeply. They learned of each other's feelings, interests, <clears throat> passions, and personalities. <clears throat> Excuse me. And just a little aside, um, I brought all the letters that um, my dad sent to my mom in this notebook, and it was so interesting reading them and hearing. I, it's a one-sided argument, of course, because we don't have my mom's letters, but the the fights that they had through the mail. I mean, she was Republican, he was Democrat. She wanted Dewey, he wanted FDR. She liked jazz, he liked big band music. He was Catholic, she was Protestant. Oh, and on and on and on, back and forth, arguing, arguing, arguing about everything. I mean, they did not agree on one thing. I don't know why, how they even kept up the correspondence because you have never seen two more different people. But yet, they were both very feisty and very stubborn. Their personalities were pretty similar because they would just go at it. And uh, so, and, and you can read about that in those letters. It's, it's pretty funny. George and Jane's letters grew in intensity as time went on, and he began to woo her from a distance. George's letters began with, you know, I like that love to bud stuff. It had a very pleasant ring. Days later, he flirted, as long as I have nobody to give my love to, why don't I send you all my love, bud? Two months went by and he wrote, tonight we have a clear, cold night, a nice half moon, and a sky full of stars just the condition to get romantic. Why in the devil aren't you here? <laughs> Eventually, they both realized that they were very special to each other and began talking about a future together when the war was over. Jane received her last overseas communication from George in August 1945, a telegram stating he was discharged and was coming home they would finally see each other after three years of correspondence. Letters were a unique form of communication. They revealed personalities, hopes, desires, and views on all aspects of life. A collection of letters reveals the freshest insight into the past, reminding us that what is now history was once real life lived by individuals as full of sensitivities, appetites, passions, and prejudices as we are. Fear of loss, the need to communicate, and a close connection to loved ones heightened the emotional power of letters. Wartime romances adjusted to long distances, kindled new relationships, and fought off the loneliness and boredom of wartime separation. As in the case of George and Jane, many romances that took years to develop were sometimes based entirely on letters. One serviceman told interviewer Larry King that his wife wrote such a warm letter that I rushed to respond, starting a long distance correspondence that would go on for two and a half years before we met. It was love at first sight strengthened by two and a half years of an increasingly loving correspondence. The United States government made the morale of the civilians a priority. Most young women at home were very clear about the purpose of the war. The troops were fighting to save the American way of life. 
Often the news the civilians heard was censored to shield them from distress and to keep morale high on the home front. Servicemen also focused their letters on winning the war and returning to home life again. They knew the reality of the casualties and the lengthy campaigns, but didn't want to mention that. Their letters remained a lifeline of optimism, helping to nourish the minds and souls of their loved ones. Not only did mail sustain morale at home, but it played an essential role in the morale of the American soldier as well. Written communication from home connected servicemen to their families, friends, sweethearts, and spouses, and boosted morale at camp or in the theaters of war. Life in the service was lonely and fearful, and letters brought the hope and optimism they needed to carry out their duty and renew their patriotism. The United States Postmaster General explained the importance of mail during wartime by stating, mail from home is a military necessity, for there is probably no factor so vital to the morale of a fighting man as frequent letters from home. Soldiers would later say, letters were the only thing that kept me going. George echoed this sentiment to Jane when he wrote, please make with the letters and keep up my morale. Your letters are a bright spot in my otherwise dull existence. Life was difficult on the home front during the war. Men were gone and millions of women lost the companionship of their fathers, sons, brothers, friends, sweethearts, and spouses. Civilians devoted their time to supporting the troops in any way they could. They volunteered at the local United Service or Organization, the USO, and rolled bandages for the Red Cross. Because of shortages, they rationed fabric, tires, sugar, butter, and nylon, and planted victory gardens. Many women worked in factories to produce war-related materiel, and they conducted war bond and blood drives. But the most important personal war effort was writing letters. The women would often have letter writing parties and sent countless letters overseas. Many women kept up an extensive correspondence with several young men. One woman told news reporter Studs Terkel, I was writing 10 or 12 letters a week. I'd get four, sometimes five letters a day back. Jane was an avid letter writer and wrote to two dozen friends and relatives. George wrote, I was much flattered to think that I am one of your favorites and of course hope that I shall remain as such. And um, just an aside about Jane, um, she was such a letter writer and she, she did write to a, at least 24 guys who were in the service during the war. And then later, after the war, she continued um, to write very long um, letters to her friends, to me, to my sister. She just loved to write letters, and um, and they were, you know, full of of news and everyday events, and such a treasure, you know, that we still have those. <coughs> The soldiers themselves sent a tremendous amount of mail back home to family and friends. When a couple fell in love, the letters increased in frequency. Wartime letters were very long, sometimes 10 pages or more. The sheer volume of mail that was sent during World War II is staggering. In 1945 alone, Americans sent three and one half billion pieces of mail overseas. It is inspiring and commendatory that the military postal system was able to locate so many servicemen scattered throughout the world. World War II may have been the last great age of the love letter. Tom Brokaw stated, love letters have been written since, but never on such a scale. Letters from home recalled details of ordinary and everyday life. These were cherished by the servicemen. Many women worried that their trivial events would be boring to the men 
who were in the midst of battle, danger, and fear. But the soldiers were eager to hear news of family and neighbors, no matter how mundane. After the war, one GI noted, letters were a big part of our emotional stability because they made us feel like we were still part of the people back home, that we hadn't been forgotten. Letters from home were filled with feelings of love and worry and loneliness, as well as news of rationing, work, and everyday challenges. The trivial events brought families closer and strengthened the soldiers' resolve to return quickly to the familiar and the comfortable life of home. They were read and reread until the next one arrived. The letters from the front took many forms. They were written on any paper or with any writing instrument available. One woman told interviewer Larry King that her father's letters were not very legible, written mostly in pencil on any paper he could get his hands on. Often the letters were crumpled and stained. Some were written from the back of a truck over rough terrain. <coughs> George explained his shaky handwriting in one letter by saying, the reason for the wavering is that a damn mine went off not far away and scared me out of a year's growth. <laughs> George often wrote on camp or official army stationery and even on Red Cross stationery. He used a lightweight, transparent onion skin paper that was easy to mail. He often typed his letters as he was General Ralph Tate's clerk and had access to a typewriter. It seems amazing that the servicemen could have written at all under such circumstances, let alone that they would be delivered to the states. And um, I have some examples. My mom got this letter on American Red Cross stationery and just freaked out like, oh my gosh, he's writing from the Red Cross. Yeah oh, something happened. And so she wrote back and he said, that was the only paper I could find. So he wrote a letter on it. And you'll notice some of these are typewritten because he had a typewriter, which was pretty unusual. Um, but then you can see in the notebook that many of them were written in pencil. Um, and here's one that was written in pencil. And then um, I have some examples of V-mail that I'll talk about. So they just really used anything that they had available. And like I said, my dad was a clerk, so he had paper and typewriter. But not all the GIs were you know, that fortunate. The letters from the women at home were interesting and diverse. They featured a variety of stationery and were often scented with perfume and a lipstick imprint a gesture popular among young women in those war years. They also sent photographs of themselves for the GIs to carry or to post in their tents. Millions of American servicemen carried these pictures, and some even carried pictures of girls they barely knew, anything to provide a distraction from the war. There are two of the pictures. <laughs> yeah, well, here, here's the first one he sent her. Here's the first one. George asked Jane to send me a snap to see if you look as I vis visualized you. It's been a long time since I met you. I want to renew acquaintance, even if it's with a picture. Later, she sent him several photographs. And he responded, I'm glad you enclosed the snaps of you in a two-piece bathing suit, as the other one did not do you justice at all. <laughs> and then one of the letters, he was writing about those pictures, and he said, but these pictures show off your fine features. <laughs> one of the most important postal services during World War II was Victory Mail, or V-Mail. V-Mail began on June 15, 1942. It used standardized 8.5 by 11 stationery, which would be this, and it shrunk it down to 4.5 by 5.5 inch stationery with its own envelope. The government also provided pre-printed blue sheets that folded to make their own envelopes. This process produced lighter, smaller letters and expedited mail service for the armed forces, 
by moving the rapidly expanding volume of wartime mail and reducing the bulk and weight of letters. The mail could send 2,500 pounds of paper in just 45 pounds. So um, once you got them shrunk, they could send a lot more letters overseas. Between June 15, 1942 and April 1, 1945, more than 556 million V-mails were sent from both sides of the ocean, in addition to the millions of letters sent by airmail. V-mail reached the soldiers much faster and provided a significant lifeline between the war front and the home front. In 1942, the Postmaster General stated, frequent and rapid communication strengthens fortitude, enlivens patriotism, makes loneliness endurable, and inspires to even greater devotion the men who are carrying on our fight from home. Even though V-mail ensured added security and speed, it would often take weeks for mail to arrive, yet it was still the most efficient postal delivery in the United States. The War Department urged both soldiers and civilians to eliminate sensitive or security information in their letters. Their motto was loose lips sink ships. Censorship was a safety precaution in the letters. Servicemen took care not to reveal any secrets or locations of their missions. Any sensitive material was blacked out or cut out with razor blades or scissors to remove words or passages that might threaten the armed forces security. One censor recalled, I had an assignment as mail censor for six weeks. I sat and read mail that our GIs were sending home. They did not want a shred of information about where we were going or when or what they heard. There was going to be an invasion. Perhaps a new kind of gun had been issued yesterday, but no letter went through unless someone read it. We had little razor blades to cut out any line or word that might make reference to a possible invasion. Writer Garson Kanan was delighted to be a censor during the war. He enjoyed reading the letters from the troops and stated that it was a literary experience. He said he read some of the greatest prose in the English language, written by 18-year-olds who couldn't spell. It didn't matter. It was the feelings. George was cautious to avoid the censorship issue. He explained to Jane, I'm glad you understand about censorship and don't ask me a lot of questions that I would be unable to answer in writing. There are many things I cannot tell you. Once, one of George's letters had a large chunk cut out of it. Here's the letter. Half of the letter got cut out. It had been a diagram of his clerk's office. When Jane noted the hole in his letter, he replied, was, was quite surprised to think the floor plan of the old office was cut out of my letter. I had to compete with a guy with a pair of scissors. He told her, I know you are disappointed because I don't write you volumes about my experience, but the reason is because of the censorship regulations. You will have to wait until I get home or else until after the war is over. World War II affected the American people for the rest of their lives. The country was cha changed by the courage, spirit, sacrifice, and endurance of those who fought and those who supported them at home. They loved intensely during the war, and they brought that intensity into their post-war lives. The war brought people together for a lifetime, even those who never would have found each other. Their love stories lasted long after the war was over. Letters introduced them, brought them together, and kept them together for the rest of their lives. In the end, the most important facet of World War II wasn't the battles fought, but the simple fact that in the midst of war, they found each other. 
Letters played a crucial role in World War II by providing communication and building morale for soldiers and civilians. But the most important benefit of letters was finding love and forming bonds that lasted the rest of their lives. When George came home from the front, he and Jane finally met again and were married. Their friend Cease was the maid of honor. They had two daughters and their marriage lasted for 57 years. Their love story is just one of millions of love stories of World War II. Thank you. Yes? I must have missed, I probably missed this. George and Jane met before he went overseas. They met one time on a double date. He was dating her best friend. So he and Cease were on a date. And Cease was my mom's best friend, so they were double dating with my mom and somebody else. Who knows? <laughs> kind of like and, pen, pen pals with a variety of... Yes. She was pen pals with lots of people. And so they had only met once, but never dated. So then he got shipped off, and Cease said, you ought to write to him because he's not getting a lot of letters from home. So she said, sure, I'll add him to my list of 25 guys that I'm writing, you know, because she had, uh, you know, a lot of cousins and high school friends. Um, and she, you know, she was, she was really quite sociable, and she had a lot of men friends. She was single. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, so she, she did a lot of writing. So then they never saw each other until three years later. And, um, uh, you know, when he sent that telegram, I'm coming home, I'll see you Saturday, and then they met again, so. Did she keep the letters of the other men that she wrote to? Um, we have, we have um, two volumes that size from one high school friend who later became um, pretty famous um, and became an author. So, and then she continued to correspond with him all her life. In, until they were both in their 90s. Um, they continued to write, but, um, but we don't have any of the other letters. But you have all of George's phones. There they are, right there. Those are all his letters there. And we have this other, this other um, guy, Ed Jablonski, who wrote a lot about like the B-17s. He, 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 has, he published a lot of books um, about jazz and Anyway, so they, they were friends in high school, so they wrote back and forth for many years, even after the war. But the, the rest of the letters are gone. And like I said, we don't have any of my mom's letters because when they got shipped home, they had to go, and they couldn't bring a lot of stuff back with them. So they couldn't bring, you know, all these letters or carry them around with them, so. Well, my, I remember my mother, she lived with her mother and my parents were married when he went to war. But she told me one time, she says, she'd be at work or something, and the letter would come from my dad, and my grandmother couldn't resist opening it. Oh, God. <laughs> Ooh. <laughs> so, Mom says sometimes they were, and she would just assume her mother hadn't read that. Yeah, movie. really, yeah. I know, it was, uh, yeah. you know, there's a few things in there that were, like, ooh, this is way, way too much information. But, <laughs> but um, I was telling somebody l happily at the end of my mom's life, you know, when she was in her 90s, we, um, I had, a, she had macular degeneration, so she couldn't see anymore. And I, it took us a year, but I read every one of those letters to her, and then we would talk about them, and she'd cry, and we, she'd tell me all these stories about my dad. I mean, it was very intimate and, and loving that she really did get a chance to read all of his letters, like right, be and she died right after that, after we finished. So, so it was kind of cool that you know she had those at the end of her life. Yeah. She, she she my mom was a pack rat. <laughs> <laughs> I found my father's diary that he had when he was in the South Pacific. That was quite interesting, too. 
<laughs> yeah, I have some things of my dad's scrapbook, and it's like, you know, he had a couple girlfriends in the different ports where he was, and he has some letters from them and some pictures, and yeah, it's like, ooh, okay, all right. But, you know, he was single too, so, <laughs> yeah. So, any other? How about, Gary? Uh, being stationed in certain areas after you eat used to food, what did your dad say about never wanting to have food? Oh, my dad was um, stationed in Casablanca, North Africa, and they had lamb and lamb and lamb every meal. And he got home. We never had lamb at our house ever. He said, I never want to see another piece of lamb. I'm never going to eat that again. I hate that stuff. And we never, my mother never served lamb ever. I've never even had, I've never even tasted lamb. That was like, we didn't have that. Yes. I had a similar experience. My dad who served in India. He was in communications. And he came back with a tapeworm. That they did oh. Not Finally figured out what it was they took care of it, but I grew up. We never had meat that wasn't burnt to a crisp. We never had a hot dog until I was grown, married, and out of the house. That's all we could afford. No. <laughs> <laughs> I know it's well, funny. I think that's because I remember my dad was the same way. He was scared of that pork, mm -hmm. right? Because the pig was eating, and he would, uh, he would cook just a little bakerless crisp. Yeah, yeah. Well, and, and the uh, the other guy that wrote the letters to my mom would go on and on and on about those K rations and the C rations and and you know explain what it was. It was powdered milk and 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 he said in one of them he said and we get um, uh, what was it? We get you know a pack of coffee and some powdered milk and four cigarettes. I mean, that, they stuck four cigarettes in the little package of food, you know. <laughs> this is what we get. We get spam and we get, you know. <laughs> so, yeah, it was funny. still doing that when I went into service in 59. Oh, really? Still getting spam and cigarettes. Spam and cigarettes, huh? <laughs> Arthur? Um, excuse my language, but another thing Dad always talked about with the food was shit on a shingle. Oh, SOS. <laughs> SOS. SOS, yeah. Yeah. Of course, he never told He never told us what, you know, he just called it SOS. Yeah. But, Until we got yeah. out there. Yeah. 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 And, we yeah. Out yeah. and, then, and we never had chip beef. Well, well, we yeah. never had chip beef on toast in, my, in our house well, either. No. Yes? You're quite lucky there because I, that you were able to communicate with your mother because that was a generation that it was and does it close in? I I have my father's or my mother's letters, but not until she died. Uh huh. You know. And this, yeah. This is kind of like, uh, you know. Yeah, I know. It's the, and they they that whole generation I think were very private and very, um, you know, and to their credit, it, you know, they were very private and. Wish I'd known them. <laughs> yeah, I know. And my dad never talked about the war when he came back. And we would ask him and ask him, and he said, "I'm not gonna. I don't want to talk about it." You know. So we're lucky to have, you know, recount recounts of people that were okay to talk about it, and we did find out what happened. You know, in many of the books and letters. But there's nothing about the battles or anything in these letters. Of course, they couldn't because of censorship, but also, like I said in, in this paper, they were trying to keep morale up at home, too, and they were not going to talk about how horrible it was. I mean, he did talk about the mud. Oh, in Italy. I mean, he talked about the weather a lot, and the mud in Italy, and they just, it was just horrible in, um, you know, and the weather, and the rain, and the, you know, um, so he would talk about the weather and he'd talk about the food, but he never talked about any of the trauma. Yeah. Yeah. So. Any other questions? Yeah. I, yeah. How, I don't think you mentioned this. How do they shrink it? You know? It's microfilm. Mm -hmm. Oh, it's yeah. microfilm. Uh -huh. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. They they did it on microfilm. So basically, took a picture oh, okay. of it. Yeah, they would take this and they would, you know take a picture of it on microfilm and then it would look like that. 
yeah. and then put it in one of those little envelopes. Well, there was a lot of handling there, wasn't there? Yeah. Well, and then you had to read them before you, you know, you had to read everything first. The censor had to read, and then you had to take a picture of it, and then you had to mail it. So, I mean, these letters went through everybody's hands. <laughs> Do you know if, if the censors were in the military or were they civilians hired? By no, they were in the military, and they took turns. They took turns, like, I think for six weeks at a time. Yeah, yeah. And that's what they would do is read the letters. And, you know, like Garson Kanan, he's, I mean, he's pretty famous. And he went on to, you know, I mean, he really enjoyed reading those. You know, he, I mean, he became a writer. So, yeah. Yes. You talk about the censorship of World War II. Um, one night in Afghanistan, I'm walking the line. We're out in the field and the Taliban's over there somewhere. And his kid's talking to his mother on his cell phone. <laughs> <laughs> he used to say he and I didn't get along too well. <laughs> but that's the kind of communication that we have now. It's instant. Yeah. So, I mean, so yeah. You know, censorship to us was... Yeah, there was a big long. delay between when they wrote the letter and after all the things it had to go through before it finally got there. Yeah, Lou? Uh, my, uh, one of my math professors who wrote the book, or actually his daughter, kind of the same thing he did, that came from her father's letters home. Oh. He landed on Normandy and D-Day. He didn't break combat until he met up with the Russians. And we have his letters, which the book is published. So you read this letter home, and then what was going on, actually going on, all of his letters was just like he was on holiday. <laughs> <laughs> was great. His letters, they are not a single yeah. word. No, no. Well, my dad was in Anzio, and so he got a leave. He got like a three-day pass and went to Rome, and they got in a lot of trouble in Rome. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, he went to Rome um, for a pass, and he wrote back to my mom and said, all I did for three days was sleep in a real bed with sheets on it. I mean, he checked into a hotel, and he just stayed there for <laughs> his whole pass, just sleeping in a bed. And then, and he did get a chance to go to St. Peter's and saw the Pope um, say Mass at St. Peter's, so, because the Pope um, at that time would come out and and a lot of GIs, you know, were at St. Peter's Square um, listening to the Pope. So, I mean, he, he did have, but, you know, that's, he was talking about that. He wasn't talking about, yeah. So. Well, in Vietnam, the one big technology improvement over letters was the invention of the small little cassette tape, mm -hmm. you can remember, and we could readily buy a cheap recorder. So what worked out great for us, and, and which unfortunately meant we wrote fewer letters, was that you know at the end of a day or something you'd just kind of crash and just talk, and then you know once you filled tape up you mailed it off and I think it was free or maybe 25 cents. And the marvelous thing for me is my son was born while I was overseas, Aww. so I could get you know the cassette tape back. Uh, where Becky would just talk about her day, and I could hear my little son in the background pulling his head off. That's <laughs> sweet. And that's and sweet. It just really was marvelous. The only trouble was, overall, we tended to record over the tape yeah. as we yeah. send it back. And so now, looking back on it, you know, we hardly have any letters, yeah. if anything. And, and all the marvelous mm. things we would talk about you know, on the tapes are just kind of yeah. lost. Now and you know, it's done with email, and there's no yeah. track, yeah. Yeah. tracking it. So all this kind of primary sources, I right. think, is going to be lost mm -hmm. from this generation to the next. But you know, I, when I was doing this research, I noticed that there are advantages and disadvantages to any kind of communication. I mean, there are definitely advantages to audio that you can actually hear people's voices yeah. and yeah, their that's emotions. Exactly. There, that's. And email has its it has its advantages, um, and these letters. I think the advantage to the letters is that there was a little bit of lag time that you could write the letter and then you could really craft 
the language that you wanted to use and use and change it and there was that gap so that you know if you wrote a letter before you send it and read it over it's like ooh you know whereas e sometimes with email you know you shoot off an email it's like ooh you know then you don't feel that way well letters there's that lag and but the disadvantage also is you don't hear I mean we do hear some of the the words in the language but you don't hear the voice you don't hear the emotion you don't see the face you don't you know cuz Skype now they can Skype and you can see the facial expressions and and there was a lot of miscommunication in these letters like my mom would write something and my dad would like actually take it the wrong way and shoot back and say what did you mean when you said this and then you know and then she would say no that's not what I meant you know so there is there were disadvantages to letters too but on the other hand it's something we can keep and that to me is that's the advantage of it that it's in addition to letters I know when I was in the service I used to look for care packages so yes. would you, did your mother ever get care packages? Yes, and they sent a lot of care packages. They would um, they would send 78 phonograph records. They actually sent records through the mail. I, can, I, I don't know how they ever got there because some of those guys had record players. And they would send records. They'd bake cookies. They would send... Um, presents you know they they did really have a lot of and magazines and um, my dad would always send her clippings from the Stars and Stripes newspaper if there was a good article in there my he would send those and a lot of those are in there and cartoons and um, books you know paperback books and yeah they so they did send a lot of packages too as well as the letters so. Well, Colleen, yeah. thank you so much oh, thank for joining you. us. Oh, thank you. I enjoyed it. And here's one of our little challenge thank cards from you. the museum. Thank yeah. you. Uh, but thank we you. hope to get you back uh, to talk about any number of other things okay, you would good. like to. Okay, good. I'd love to. Yeah. So please stick around. We have plenty of refreshments still <coughs> in the back. And come up and look thank at you. the marvelous uh, yeah. exhibit here. And, and, look, at the, and look at the letters. Yeah. Can I take this off yes. now?